Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to the National Gallery. I'm delighted to see so many of you here on this uh, very damp spring day. Um, I'm also delighted to have an opportunity to talk to you about this painting. This is one of my very favorite paintings in the National Gallery. And it's one of my favorite paintings in the National Gallery because it is a number of things all at the same time. It's a painting of narrative. It's telling us a story a story that we can easily read. But it's also one of my favorite paintings because there are mysteries about it. There are issues around what perhaps the artist is trying to tell us that maybe are not so easy to immediately get. They need a little bit of unpicking. So this, as I say, is a narrative. This is a story of the artist Joseph Wright of Derby tells us in the title what's going on. It is an experiment on a bird in an air pump. And the experiment has been conducted in a house, in a domestic setting. We can see in the background uh, some of the um, architecture of the house, a very prominent door, for instance, and this window here. And the people around are watching the experiment being conducted. Uh, they are uh, coming together to perhaps learn about the science involved in the experiment, but also to be entertained. And we have around the uh, air pump here different reactions to what's going on. These different people, different family members, we're not altogether sure exactly how they are related, but different people reacting uh, in quite dramatic ways to the experiment. The experiment is being conducted on a bird. This is actually a cockatoo. And what is happening is this a device here, you can perhaps see the crank, is turned and the air is sucked out of the glass jar. Air is colorless. So if we suck the air out of the glass jar and there's nothing in it, there's not much to see. It doesn't make for a very entertaining experiment. So what do we do if we want to make it entertaining? We up the ante and we put an animal inside it. See what happens if we suck all the air out. And what's happening is pretty horrific. I think, and in fact we know that people uh, in the 18th century who saw this experiment also thought it was pretty horrific. This bird is being slowly asphyxiated. And so the people around are reacting to the science but also to the entertainment. When I look at this painting, the people that I see first are these two girls. They're the most prominently lit. The entire group are lit by this candle which is behind this glass jar here. And this is what was known as the candlelight technique, rather prosaically, very English, does exactly what it says on the tin. Uh, the Italians call it chiaroscuro. And in effect, what that means is that all the important bits of the painting are lit directly. And everything else is shrouded in darkness because it's not important. Just like if you go to the theater and you see somebody spotlit, all your attention is on that person rather than on what's going on outside. And that's what's happening here. And it gives a very dramatic sense, perhaps melodramatic sense, of what's happening. So these girls are uh, immediately lit. And I would say they are reacting with horror. In fact, the oldest girl can't even look. She's covering up her eyes. It's too awful. Perhaps this cockatoo is their pet. The other little girl, I love this piece of painting here. She's holding on to her older sister's dress. Uh, she is frightened and she wants perhaps her older sister to comfort her. Also another fantastic piece of painting is their reflection or the reflection of the little girl's sleeve on the table here. Uh, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful piece of observation and painting. And they are repulsed perhaps by what's happening. Now the man behind them, we don't know who he is, perhaps he is their father. I like to think maybe he's their father. And he's got his arm around the bigger girl. But he's not comforting her, is he? He's not saying it will be OK. He's pointing at the experiment. He's pointing at the bird. I think that he is saying to his daughter, don't avert your gaze. Look, see what is happening. Watch. You can learn. You can learn something important about nature and the world. And for a long time, I used to think, what a horrible man. What a terrible father. What kind of a cruel brute does that? But then I caught myself with my children watching television, watching a nature program in which a lion was attacking a zebra. And my daughters were like, no, we can't look. And I was like, no, 
we must look. You must see because this is nature. And I think that's what he's doing. He's trying to teach them a lesson. On the other side of the painting, we have this couple. Again, what a fantastic piece of painting because we know without being told that they're in love. They're staring into each other's eyes. Are they looking at the bird? No. Do they care? No. Why? Because they're in love. What is happening between the two of them is more important to them than what's happening here. This little boy here, he's craning forward, I think. He's looking at the bird. He's rapt to see what happens next. I think that he is saying, go on, do it. He wants to see what we can do, what this experiment can do. He wants it to be fulfilled. This gentleman here, he is behaving as an 18th century man would be expected to behave, dispassionately, without any emotion. He's even got his watch out. Perhaps he's timing how long the bird has left. He is not reacting like the girls are reacting. That's a sort of 18th century uh, division between genders that perhaps we don't recognize now. So he is doing what a man then would be expected to do. And finally, we have this man here, this older gentleman. He's not looking at the bird either, is he? He is, in fact, staring possibly at the candle. And I think that he is thinking. He's not necessarily thinking about what's happening with the bird, but he's, I think, thinking about what this means, what is happening to us, to him, if we can do these things. What are some of the philosophical implications of this experiment? Where might we as humans be going if this is our world? So they are all, as I said, clustered around here. They are in a circle, uh, as it were. And this circle would have been very recognized by 18th century uh, viewers of paintings because we see similar circles in lots of history paintings at the time. Paintings where actually we are asked to recognize what's happening in the middle, but also to let our eyes move around the painting. And this, I think, happens very neatly here. We are pulled almost in a circle, but we are part of that circle. We are here. We are pulled in. And 18th century viewers, I think, would have recognized the reactions of these people. This is a painting that would have spoken to them, perhaps about their reactions to science or the reactions of people that they knew. It was very contemporary, very of the moment. It's painted by a man called Joseph Wright of Derby. Joseph Wright, born in Derby. Um, and he um, came down to London at the age of 16 to uh, train to be an artist. He trained under a man called Thomas Hudson. Uh, Thomas Hudson, a very successful portrait painter at the time, also painted Sir Joshua, uh, also trained rather, Joshua Reynolds. And, um, we don't quite know exactly when Joseph Wright uh, got his um, Of Derby addition to his name. There's some suggestion that it happened when he came down to London. There was another Joseph Wright. So to distinguish them, he became Joseph Wright of Derby. But he retained that name throughout his career. In fact, he referred to himself as Joseph Wright of Derby. Now, I don't know where you are from, but if you think about how you refer to yourself, you don't really say, hi, I'm so-and-so from wherever or of wherever and for me that indicates that Joseph Wright was very proud in fact more than proud of the place where he was from he wanted people to know that he was from Derby specifically why might that be so well at this time Derby was a center of science a center of industry a center of what we call the industrial revolution and it was full of people who were fascinated by science but they weren't just fascinated by science for um, intellectual uh, purposes. It wasn't just pure science as we might think of today. They wanted to use cutting edge technology in business. They wanted to make money. Derby, perhaps the modern equivalent might be Silicon Valley, full of what we might now call entrepreneurs. Uh, people like Josiah Wedgwood, uh, who were using uh, the examples of scientists across Europe in their business to make money, to become more efficient. And Joseph Wright knew lots of these people. He was friends with lots of these people. Um, and he um, 
hung out with them effectively. Uh, they uh, used to meet regularly. And um, people like um, Erasmus Darwin, the grandfather of Charles Darwin, people like James Watt, uh, people like Joseph Priestley, uh, they were all uh, friends together in uh, this part of England. And they used to meet uh, regularly to exchange ideas, to talk about what they'd read, who they'd been writing to, who'd been writing to them. And they used to meet together uh, when there was a full moon. And they would meet at lunchtime and have a very good lunch. Now, nowadays, you could have a good lunch last all afternoon, and you could probably get a cab home. Uh, but in the 18th century, um, it would be very dangerous to go home in the dark. You might fall over, or your horse might fall over. So that's why they met when there was a full moon. So the moon might light up their journey home. And they called themselves the Lunar Society. And Wright, as I say, not exactly a member, but friends with people who were part of the Lunar Society. And there's some suggestion that this man here might be based on Erasmus Darwin. And the central person, the uh, philosopher, uh, at this time, people doing these sort of experiments were called uh, natural philosophers. And he is suggested to have been based on a man called John Whitehurst, who was a friend of uh, Joseph Wright's and was um, interested in uh, geology, amongst many other things. So perhaps Wright is including these people in his painting and making allusions to the Lunar Society. And you will see out of the window here, there is a moon. So perhaps, as well as uh, Right, talking about how um, science might affect people across Britain. He's also making allusions to his scientific friends, his entrepreneurial friends. Uh, he's saying something about a movement that we now call, in fact, even then it was called the Enlightenment. Again, this painting all about light. Maybe there are connections here uh, to this light and the idea of the Enlightenment. Now, the Enlightenment a uh, very complex idea. Uh, people have been sort of talking about it uh, for a very long time. But in effect, the idea of the Enlightenment is exactly what it says, that there previously was a time where we, as people, were shrouded in darkness, in ignorance. If we ask a question about why things are the way they are, why are there volcanoes, for instance, if the answer is because God made them, there's nowhere else to go with your inquiry. Because who am I to... Talk about why did God do what he did? He does what he does. But gradually, across Europe, and particularly in Britain, people were saying, well, that answer doesn't really satisfy me. We want to find out more. We want to understand. And part of this painting is about that understanding. The experiment that we are looking at, the air pump experiment, is one that even in Wright's day was about 100 years old. So we're not actually looking at something that this audience would have considered to be cutting edge. If we had been looking at that sort of experiment, it would probably have been something to do with electricity, which at that time was the sort of cutting edge of science. But Wright doesn't show us electricity. He shows us the air pump. Why might that be so? Well, this experiment is a key experiment in the development of the Enlightenment put together by uh, a man called Robert Boyle in Oxford. And at, that, at Boyle's time, there were debates about the nature of air. What is air like? But most of those debates were theological or uh, philosophical. They weren't scientific as we might understand them now. And so Boyle constructed an experiment together with other people which would attempt to show what air might be like or that there was air. And he constructed one of these with this uh, crank here and created a vacuum, took the air out of a glass jar. And this experiment that Wright is showing us here is very similar, if not exactly the same, but very similar to um, Boyle's experiment. And the reason we know that is that what Boyle did is he published a book about his experiment in which he had drawings, images of the uh, air pump itself, so that people who were interested could repeat the experiment themselves. Now, that is key in the development of the Enlightenment because what that is saying is that this experiment can be shared amongst all of us. It's not just something that only the uh, condescenti know about. Anybody can now repeat that. 
And today, we have peer-reviewed journals which do exactly the same. People write about their experiments in a way that enables, in theory at least, people to recreate that experiment so that we can know that it is true, that it is valid. So right here is asking us to engage directly with ideas about the Enlightenment, ideas about science, ideas about the world around us. But maybe there's something else happening. Maybe there's something a bit more. Maybe there's something that uh, not everybody looking at this painting at the time would have understood. In 18th century Britain at this time, uh, there were a, a plethora of clubs and societies. A um, writer in the 1960s called Jürgen Habermas coined the term the public sphere. And what he was trying to explain is how did the Enlightenment and political ideas in Britain and in France at this time spread. And his theory is that these ideas spread because people met up in like-minded groups and talked to each other. But they didn't just meet in a single group of people who uh, uh, had similar ideas. They met in lots of different groups. And so ideas spread. And we were able to talk to each other about things. Perhaps the opposite of our current social media generation. And Wright himself was a member of all sorts of different groups and knew people who were members of all sorts of different groups who were exchanging ideas about things. Wright himself was asked to join the Royal Academy down in London by uh, Joshua Reynolds, uh, uh, who, as we know, had trained with his master. And I love the difference between the two of them. Reynolds, very much metropolitan, uh, very much part of the elite, whereas Wright, very much uh, happy with Derby, happy to be with entrepreneurs rather than aristocrats, uh, didn't want to come down to London, didn't want to join the Royal Academy. But his friends in the Lunar Society were also members of different groups. Erasmus Darwin here, for instance, uh, was, as well as being a member of the Lunar Society, uh, a member of the Royal Society. He then uh, was also a Freemason. Other friends of Wright were also Freemasons. Masons, Josiah Wedgwood, for instance. And there is a lot of writing about how Freemasonry at this time spread or enabled the spread of science. One of the things about Freemasonry is that it's an inquiring uh, group, an inquiring society, and it encouraged people who were questioning their society, who were perhaps slightly turning their backs on religious ideas, religious answers, and were seeking other things. And lots of Masonic lodges actively encouraged people to come and talk about sciences. So we don't know if Wright himself was a Freemason. We have no evidence. But lots of the people that he knew were. And there are other readings of this painting. The moon, going back to the moon again, uh, perhaps the moon is here being used as a Masonic symbol. It is one of the three lights of Freemasonry, the light of nature. And maybe that fits in with this experiment about nature, about the natural world. So maybe right here is talking about Freemasonry or talking to Freemasons. His previous picture, a picture of uh, an orrery, includes two prominent Freemasons. In fact, was bought by a Freemason. So maybe there are some of these elements going on as well. One of the things I haven't spoken about in this painting is right at the front, it's this thing here. And I suspect that we, as the viewers, are intended to look at this and understand it. It is so prominent in the painting. What is it? The brief answer is, we don't know. Some people suggest that it is a skull, a, kind of, a, a, a cancerous, diseased skull. And that fits in with ideas about this candle and this gentleman looking, because maybe those are about ideas about our mortality. It's a memento mori. As the candle burns down, we think about the brevity of our lives. And as we look at skulls, we think about what's going to happen to us next. Doesn't look much like a skull to me, but that's just me. Other people have suggested maybe it's a lung, and perhaps this thing pointing into it is a straw to inflate the lung. Well, that would make perfect sense if this is an experiment about air, which it is, then maybe the lung is also being used. I'm not quite sure what animal's lung this might be. 
I think, personally, and this is really is me personally, that this is a reference by right to alchemy. At this time, uh, chemistry had been pulling away from their predecessors, alchemists. Alchemists had been doing experiments for hundreds of years in all sorts of ways, but the ultimate end of alchemy is to turn one substance into another substance, silver or usually gold. But lots of the things that alchemists did were used by chemists because they were, um, they were correct, they were right. And we know that Wright himself was interested in alchemy because a few years later he painted a painting of an alchemist. A painting of an alchemist who is inadvertently discovering magnesium in his, uh, in his chemistry lab. So we know that Wright understood a little bit at least about alchemy and was interested. Now, the first thing that alchemists do in order to turn one substance into another is they burn it down, the negredo. They turn it into a blackened object so that it can become something else. It can become, perhaps coming back to the moon, silver here. So, we have an experiment that these people are reacting to. We have an experiment that could be talking about ideas of the Enlightenment, ideas where we are all beginning to understand our world. We have an experiment that could also be referring to Freemasonry, to people who are also interested in understanding our world. But we might also have a painting which acknowledges the people who were before the scientists. Perhaps ironically, although there is no way Wright could possibly have known, Boyle himself was interested in alchemy. In fact, conducted a number of uh, alchemic experiments while in Oxford, which he wrote down but never published for fear that he would uh, be ridiculed and lose his position. So there is a link there, although Wright can't possibly have known that. So there are lots of different elements of things going on here, lots of different ways of reading this particular painting. But are we looking at a view into history? Are we looking at the way that people in the 18th century would have thought about science, or might have thought about science, or might have thought about themselves engaging with science? Is this just a relic of the past, which might not have any relevance to us today except as a piece of history? Well, I would contend not. I would contend that these people are reacting in exactly the same ways that we react today to science. We may not, not have scientists come to our living rooms and conduct experiments. We may not go out and see people doing science in front of us, but we are acutely aware of science in our lives, in our world. Let's imagine that we're not looking at a poor bird who is being asphyxiated. Let's imagine that we are thinking about a current modern scientific development. Human cloning, for instance. How might we think about human cloning? It's a horror. I can't even look at it. What, ha what are we doing? It's an abomination. What might happen? We need to have some sort of human emotional response. No, no, no. There is a lot that we can learn from human cloning. Let's not cover our eyes and pretend it's not happening. It is part of nature. It is understanding an element of nature. We need to engage with it. We don't care about human cloning. We're in love. Go on, clone, clone away. One, two, three, I want to see what happens. Let's be just passionate about this. Scientific, perhaps. And think about it without the human emotions getting in the way. What does it mean to Clone, let's think about the science. What kind of people are we if we could do this? What is our relationship to the world around us? Perhaps what is our relationship to God? How do we think about this experiment? And these reactions are reactions we still have to this day. We still are connecting to science in these ways, and that to me takes this painting out of the 18th century squarely into the 21st century. How are all of us who are looking at this painting going to think about our relationship to the natural world, the world in which we all live, 
and the science that is not just telling us about the world, but impacting on the world as well. What are we going to think about our civilization? Now, one of the things that is not in this painting at all is God. There are lots of readings of Joseph Wright's paintings which connect them to uh, religious paintings. And you might do that yourself. This philosopher here, he's reaching forward. Is he encouraging us to come in? But his hand movement looks very much like a blessing. He himself, with his wild long hair, might look like a figure from the Bible. The bird, a cockatoo, maybe that's a symbol connecting to the dove of the Holy Spirit. And the moon, maybe that is connecting to some ideas of purity as well. So perhaps God is here in this painting, but not as a religion, but as humans taking the place of God. We are now understanding the world for ourselves. The answer, because God made it so, is no longer enough. God does not necessarily make it so. We might make it so. So the experiment is continuing in front of us. At the back is this little boy. I haven't mentioned him yet. Um, I don't know. I like to think that the little boy perhaps is a sly reference to people like Josiah Wedgwood, who were developing the factory system at this time, uh, what we would now think of as very brutal and very often filled with children, often orphans, who couldn't run away, they had nowhere to go to. And maybe right here is commenting on this because this little boy in the background, he is in the shadows, he's not taking part, but he is essential to what is happening. And he is pulling on this rope and there above him is a birdcage. Now, this again is where we can come in. Are we optimistic people or pessimistic people? Is this a glass half full or glass half empty painting? If we are optimistic and it's a glass half full painting, what is happening is the philosopher, can you see his hand, is at the top. He is waiting till the 11th hour, the final moment when the bird is about to breathe his last and then he's going to open the stopcock. Air is going to flood in, the bird is going to come out and the boy is lowering the cage because the bird is going to survive. He's going to live. But are we glass half empty people? Is the philosopher making sure that no air can possibly get in? And we are watching the very last moments of this poor animal, and the boy is raising the cage because he doesn't need it. I'll leave you to decide what's happening in this picture, and you to decide how you think about science. Many thanks indeed. <laughs>